Hey guys, it's Dr. Dan here. Welcome back to my channel. Today I have another doctor reaction video on another episode of Grey's Anatomy. This is an episode on polytraumas, how a patient that is severely injured gets handled by Meredith Grey and company. Coming at you right after this. <music> So today I want to try something new. At the end of the episode, I am going to give two ratings to the episode. One is a realism rating, you know, how realistic was this show, did it make any ridiculous errors, and a second one is just an entertainment score. You know, how entertained was I, you know, is it an episode that I would recommend to my friends and family? So make sure you stick around to the end of the episode so you can hear my rating and why I felt that way. And one favor I'm going to ask from you guys is that let's tell the YouTube algorithm that you absolutely love these Dr. Reacts videos, so make sure you smash that like button, hit the subscribe, and bell notification so you don't miss any future Dr. Reacts videos. Let's get started. Male, mid 30s, lost vitals in the field, shock the max sinus attack, possible fractures in both arms, unstable pelvis. Okay, on three, two, three. Good. Go. Open right tip tip, rigid abdomen. It almost sounds like the EMT here is speaking in a foreign language. It's just a blur of words here. But to the medical professionals who are on the scene, all of these injuries that the EMT is stating out loud are giving them more information on how to treat this patient next. The EMT is just stating what suspected injuries this patient has. The things that stood out to me as an orthopedic surgeon is number one, she mentioned an unstable pelvis. So the pelvis is this bony ring and it looks like this on x-ray. And if there's a high energy trauma, the pelvis can get crushed and it can get splayed open kind of like this on x-ray and this is a very dangerous injury it can actually cause also lots of soft tissue injuries internal injuries where the bladder can also rupture and there can be blood vessels that tear and it's pretty life-threatening second injury that stood out to me is she mentioned open tib fib so tib fib refers to tibia and fibula, which is our leg bones in the calf, that's a pretty serious injury. So a tib fib looks like this on x-ray. A broken tib fib looks like this. That looks pretty serious. More serious injury is what she referred to as an open tib fib. So open refers to an open fracture. And an open fracture occurs when there is actually a soft tissue injury and the bone actually pokes out through the skin because the fracture is so bad. This is a pretty dangerous injury because it can lead to infections later and it's considered a surgical emergency. If my UR reports are right, you've been working for three days straight. When do you sleep? Do you keep tabs on all your attendings or just the new guys? Pretty not realistic. Surgeons are not going to be working for three days straight no matter you know, how hardcore a surgeon wants to be and all the patients are rolling in. That just doesn't happen and someone cannot function on three days without sleep. It would be very dangerous and just doesn't happen. His IV blue. He's yeah, he okay. needs that access now. Yes, I'm doing it, sir. So why don't you find the deadline? So what's going on here, guys? In the last reaction video, I thought the two of them had a thing where he pulled out the icicle, they were making out, and now he's being super mean. No clue. But here he's telling her that they need access. And what that is is IV access, and they need a line so that they can put in blood into the patient or give the patient medications in the setting of a trauma like this. Shooting drugs? Oh my god. No, we're practicing IVs. How else are we supposed to learn? Yang never lets us do anything. So you're practicing on each other? We did it at Baylor. It's cool. No, it's not cool. It's crazy. It's like creepy basement crazy. D don't tell anyone. Interestingly enough, when I was a third year medical student, we actually practiced IVs on each other as part of the curriculum. It was part of like the orientation before we started our clinical rotations. Most realistic way to learn how to put in an IV. And I, I remember being kind of nervous about it. It went fine and everything, but we did practice on each other. So this is actually kind of realistic. Getting worse. My pain I hate is this. getting worse. I'm not gonna win the solo surgery practicing on plastic, man. You're not gonna win the solo surgery because you suck. <laughs> Your bedside <laughs> manner is what sucks. What? <laughs> What did you say? <laughs> All right, so, you know, this actually simulator like this, we actually used in medical school as well. And I gotta tell you, doing simulations on a dummy like this is not very realistic, but it does help you think through your knowledge base and algorithms in your mind so that when it comes down to actual patient scenarios, it's more fresh in your head. So they are helpful. Now, 
These days, they're coming up with more realistic things than simulation dummies. They're actually using augmented reality, they're using virtual reality, and there's a lot more technologies that's allowing a more realistic simulations. What does a guy have to do to get a beating this bad? Maybe he'll tell us when he wakes up. Yeah, let's hope he makes it that long. Sorry, I could use a doctor. Be one. So what I noticed here is that they're actually using a device called an external fixator to fix these fractures on this patient. And these are the little devices that you see, like the rods and the little click things. And what an external fixator is that they're drilling these rods into the patient's bone and they're using the device externally to stabilize these fractures. The goal of a lot of orthopedics fracture surgery is that you actually go down to the bone where the fracture is and put plates and screws across where the fracture is to stabilize the fracture. And that's what's called internal fixation, where you're going into the body and you're putting the plate and screws to stabilize the fracture. This is the same thing, only you're doing it externally outside of the skin, and that's why it's called external fixation. Now, external fixation is really used in orthopedics for something called damage control orthopedics in polytraumas. And when someone comes in and they're severely injured and they're very unstable, doing a fracture surgery for internal fixation can actually cause a lot of bleeding and destabilize the patient further and lead to something called a second hit phenomenon and destabilize the patient more. You don't want that. And so you use these external fixators, which are very quick to put in. There's not much bleeding and you wait until the patient is more stable and you go in and do the internal fixation surgery later on when the patient is more stable. B1. I understand that risks are part of the package. That's why you people make me go cross-eyed signing all these forms. You're signing a do not resuscitate order. If it's my time to go. She doesn't want to be on a life support kind of thing. A DNR stands for do not resuscitate. And what that is, is a directive that's given to the patient's healthcare providers. The patient does not want any cardiopulmonary resuscitation, aka CPR. And you might be asking, why wouldn't anyone want CPR? Why wouldn't you want them to save a patient's life? And there's lots of reasons for this, some of them being, number one, there's no medical benefit expected from bringing the patient back. So the patient might be on the edge of death and, you know, they just don't want to be brought back. Number two, quality of life suffers with CPR and they may be put on a ventilator like the patient is mentioning here and they don't want that type of quality of life. Number three is that the patient may be near death already. They may have terminal cancer or some illness where basically they just want a natural death instead of bringing brought back and then they have to go through a bunch of pain and suffering. And so that's another reason why they might request a DNR. This is a very personal decision, and it's a decision that's made between the patient, the patient's doctor, and the family members also being involved, but ultimately it's up to the patient. Sorry, we, we do this every time. She signs the paper, we kiss goodbye, and then after the surgery, we say hello again. That sounds like a plan to me. I gotta tell you, I have to disagree with Dr. Bailey here. This does not sound like a good plan to me. I think it's a setup for disaster. The patient's expectations are clearly that the wife is gonna come back from the surgery fine with no problems. And I think this just is a setup for disaster because when I'm doing patient care, even if I know that a complication is rare, I really make sure that the patient and the patient's family understand that that complication could happen to the patient and that when it happens, it's very real. I think it's very important so that they can be emotionally and mentally ready should that complication happen. And so honestly, I think this is a setup for disaster here in the episode. Tumor's hemorrhaging. Her brain's starting to swell. Push 70 to mannitol. She's braiding down a one of atropine. Let's make sure these two get a chance to say hello again. Not a good scenario. It looks like tumor that he's removing is bleeding. And this is a situation where there's something called elevated intracranial pressure or ICP, elevated ICP. And the skull is in closed space and there's not much room in there for the brain. And so if there's anything like bleeding happening or anything that's you know space occupying, there's increased pressure on the brain tissues and inside the skull. And that can cause permanent brain injury. It can also cause something called a brain 
herniation, which is very dangerous and can kill the patient. And so mannitol is being given here to try to decrease the ICP. Dr. Bailey is ordering atropine here, which is actually meant to treat bradycardia or a slow heartbeat, which happens with increased ICP. Something you're forgetting. Uh, oh, I'm surprised you even passed your intern exam. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> So I'm surprised here that George is not suspecting anything weird going on, but it looks like he's very laser focused on saving this cadaver's life, so I have to commend him. I see dead people. Get out. I need off my hunt case. So in a one-time only offer, I'm gonna trade you my beaten to a pulp trauma palooza patient for no less than uh, three of your cadavers. <laughs> Pony up. This is definitely surgical residents being obsessed with trying to get better, right? So they are obsessed with these cadavers, they wanna practice on these cadavers, and I get it because in residency you are so worried that you're not gonna be prepared to operate on real patients when you're done with residency, so you really take up any learning opportunity that you can, and that's what you're seeing here. lunch by cadavers that's pretty unsanitary. Second thing is that you see Meredith here like practicing with a needle driver and I actually used to do this all the time. I used to carry around a needle driver because my senior residents and my attendings told me to do this and I would practice like palming the needle driver and rotating in my hand opening it and closing it. I used to actually tie suture to my pants uh, like these like the scrubs and I would practice tying knots everywhere I went and so this was part of surgical training is that in your downtime you wanted to actually practice some of these techniques whenever you could so that you would be skilled in the OR and I remember people looking at me weird when I'd like be walking around with a needle driver but that was the way it was doing anything make them do something they're just standing around mr bullard they're keeping her comfortable that's all they can do you and rosie agreed there would be no extreme measures taken if her time came her time is here let's go please no please so sad. do something i think i told you guys that this was a setup for disaster and unfortunately this patient is not ready for his wife's death could have been prevented with a better conversation beforehand. Is there this much blood in his urine before? No. Well, he's going to need a bedside cystogram. Dibs on that. No, 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 it's mine. And his bladder repair is mine, too. No, we traded for him. No, no, we, see, no we, we never traded. And just to prove you wrong, three, next time this guy crashes, you put in his chest tube. Blood in the urine could actually mean an injury to the bladder, like Christina mentioned here. A cystoscopy is actually a procedure where a camera is put in through the urethra, which is the tube that actually lets out the urine from the bladder and the camera goes up into the bladder and you can actually take a look around to see where that injury is. Now the weird thing here is that Christina is not a urologist and someone actually left a comment in my last reaction video that was pretty accurate. In Grey's Anatomy these residents that are general surgery are actually out and about doing random surgical specialties like cardiothoracic or neurosurgery or in this case urology and that definitely does not happen in the hospital. Urology is a separate residency and those residents spend five years doing only urologic procedures. They don't just jump around from the heart to the kidneys, to the bladder. That doesn't happen, so that's not very realistic. Get away. I said step away from him. I'm just saying that we were saving his life. No, what you did was pick over him like vultures, like a bunch of children fighting over toys. What you did was treat a man as fighting to live as if he's already dead. You've no sense, no decency, and no respect. <sighs> wow. So Dr. Hunt here definitely has a point. Surgeons, they can see a problem and they can see it just as an anatomic problem. So the bladder is torn. I'm going to go in and I'm going to fix it. I'm going to repair it. There is a broken bone. I'm going to go in and fix the bone surgically. But, you know, in doctoring, you always have to remember that there is a patient and a story and emotions behind every patient that you see. And that's the most important part of doctoring. Surgery is actually easy. Going in there and fixing it, the hardest part and the most important part of being a surgeon is actually speaking to the patient before the surgery, reassuring them, reassuring the family, speaking to them afterwards about expectations. And really that human connection to the patient is the most important thing that we do as doctors. My dad died when I was nine. 
in a car accident. I was with him in the car. While we waited for the ambulance, I tried to keep his chest closed so he wouldn't bleed so much. My hands felt his heart stop beating. Whoa. That's why I do this. It's also why I win all the contests. I love that line at the end that Christina says, that's why I win all the contests. So very hardworking. And this actually brings me back, you know, in this whole journey of becoming a doctor, I would tell you that looking around in medical school, I would see my classmates, they were all incredibly hardworking. And similar to Christina, I didn't ask them all, but I know that they were working so hard because they all had their own story of why they wanted to become a doctor, similar to Christina. Yes! You don't get to die! Yes. Nice job. <laughs> nice work, George. Oh, hi. Um, thanks. I am. All right, George, nice positive ending. In terms of this episode, guys, I would say on a realism scale, I think that most of what they presented here was pretty realistic. They did a good job with the orthopedic trauma and external fixators and the damage control orthopedics. So I'm gonna give this episode a eight out of 10 for realism. In terms of entertainment value, even the medical situations are not like super captivating. I'm gonna give the entertainment value here a five out of 10 on this episode. All right guys, so thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this episode and learned something, please smash that like button below. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next Dr. Reacts video. I appreciate you guys being here. Make sure you comment below what you want me to react to next. I'll see you on the next video.